people see guns mainly in television and media and video games and things like that. There's a mythology that's been built up about the gun. And there's a gap between what it really does and, and what we think about it. It's a very difficult issue to deal with. We, we can't keep going as we've been going in the past. Our idea is to just generate enough talk that people will try and change. I definitely trapped Sandra into this project and it's because I'm full of BS in a way I can really talk a mean streak when I have to. He tracked me down and uh, had coffee a few times and I kind of liked the idea. Um, I, I liked the concept. So I basically at that time felt that I would see if I couldn't convince her to take a wild gamble with me. So we talked about brainstorming and developing it further. We thought the project should involve very important themes at this particular time of history, like technology, like the environment, like uh, atrocities, what was going on in the world, like violence. I said to her quite flippantly, well, I think we'll get some guns and do something with guns. And that spoke really strongly to me immediately that, of course, um, real guns, the stories would be poignant and there'd be no misunderstanding about, about the voice of these things no Hollywood recreation or veneer finish. It meant nothing to me that it would be hard to get guns. <laughs> I just figured I'd go out and get some guns. So that's how simplistic I really am. And we thought this could be doable, going at it as a Millennium Project, challenging violence at this time. And we both felt that it was a really important issue, that it was affecting so many people um, daily. It's a project of hope because, you know, we did it to enact change. We went to Israel to see Yad Vashem because Yad Vashem was a memorial site and uh, we thought that that memorial site would give us some clues to what we were trying to do and it did have some great impact on us. You can't go to a place like Yad Vashem and come away without some sort of feeling, emotion. It's not something that's apparent, it becomes more assumed into your work. It became apparent that it would be very easy to mislead people on the purpose of our installation. And that's where the images of the victims and the survivors came into our minds and the idea that we had to have a presence outside of the sculpture What's very interesting about the trips is that we had not much set up before we left, a few contacts, but once we got there, we were so busy, we didn't breathe. I mean, there wasn't a day off, and it was because things just fell in, just in an extraordinary way. For instance, we had the luck to meet a Canadian diplomat there, assigned in uh, Jerusalem, and he connected us to the Piello. So we drove in, in his car to um, the West Bank, he had a cell phone. He made a call, and we thought we'd gone to the headquarters of the FETA organization, which is a youth unit of the PLO, but it wasn't there anymore. So with the cell phone, they directed us to where the headquarters were. We just asked if we could find some Palestinians to talk to, but we ended up going and having an interview with uh, Yasser Arafat's right-hand person. In the beginning of this century, we have been paying with a great deal of uh, victims, either in prisons or in terms of martyrs or in terms of uh, injured. We have thousands of uh, disabled people because of the uh, because of the Israeli weapons during the Intifada. And we hope that, uh, that uh, the day will come when the entire world will celebrate that all of the weapons will be destroyed. And, uh, we will be in a world without weapons, except for the weapons of the mind. And uh, we hope for peace, we wish for peace for all the people of the world. And we are the most people in the world that require peace, that need peace. We are uh, hoping of a for a Palestinian state without weapons.
And the, two or th the three or four, <laughs> three or four handguns and rifles we have, we'll give them to you after we announce the state, the declaration of the Palestinian state. We uh, will be the first uh, country, the first country that uh, dreams to live without weapons. We don't need them. We don't need tanks, uh, planes, rifles, nothing. Whoever whoever wants to attack us, go ahead. I mean, no, whatever, no problem. <laughs> Um, in your opinion, who is the greatest peacemaker of all time? I don't think there's anyone that has been a really, truly great peacemaker in the world. Ah. Because right now, we're still living in a time of war. There's still a great deal of violence. Because right, even, the, uh, even the prophets, when they, were, they came to make peace, they were warred on, they failed. The, the ones that are sent by God to make peace, they, they couldn't do it. <laughs> but <laughs> now, to cynical people in Northern Ireland, this idea that you could pers persuade paramilitaries here to hand over guns when the government can't win your own countryman, John de Chastelan, can't. Seems a bit, in, uh, seems a bit innocent, almost a bit naive. This trip is a research trip. Um, so we're contacting groups and we're telling them about our intention and our story. And um, we're trying to get support that way. And what's the reaction be to your approaches? People are interested. Of course, at the beginning, uh, you know, they don't know us from anyone. And so it, it, uh, they're a bit guarded, but as we're talking more about this and explaining the whole range of this, because it is a sculpture, it asks people to come into it, to donate into it, and then it travels and tours around the world and gives back. So uh, the response uh, after we get talking to people has been extremely positive. What we're doing here is trying to have a dialogue, trying to get people involved. What we're doing is asking for symbols of people who are desperately trying to move towards peace. And the everyday person that we've talked to here and the peace groups that we've talked to here have already stated that they are wholeheartedly moving towards peace. What we're asking is for a symbolic gesture towards that effort. Getting a firearm is going to be very difficult, um, and we understand that. At the same time, nothing is impossible. Ireland has something to show the world. Northern Ireland does. Belfast does. And that is that there's a process in the world of hope and that peace can happen. And what we're hoping is instead of a dialogue, we receive words, maybe a poetry, maybe a story, maybe an image of an individual who's a survivor. And in that way, we can honor those people and honor the people of Belfast. What would it do if you were living in this house and you didn't support this whole thing? You <laughs> well, couldn't say a damn thing, could that's you? That's right. Yeah, that's right, exactly. No, I think one of the persons it's in the house is next door is coming out here. So. Pretty intimidating, yeah. I'd say. Right at the beginning, um, the statement was, you can't possibly do this because deactivated firearms are too expensive to do. They cost a 125 to 150 each firearm, so forget it. Nobody's going to put that kind of money in. So Wallace and I took, uh, we, my brother-in-law, Dean, gave us his old shotgun. He didn't, wasn't using it, didn't want it in the house anymore. So we took that shotgun to a machine shop and we said, which ways can we deactivate this? How can we destroy it? We tried crushing, we tried taking a sledgehammer to it, we tried uh, a settling torch, and uh, then at the back there was this plasma torch. This guy was cutting this plasma torch. And I said, how about that thing? Ah, oh, it will never work. No, nah, not suitable. It was perfect. It was the most amazing thing. Cut through the weapon on one side, melted the inside of it, completely deactivated in all ways, and uh, was untouched on the other side, which was very interesting for the idea of the sculpture, that you could either have the destructive forces shown, or you could have the menacing forces of the untouched, uh, at least on the surface, untouched firearm. 
So now we had to, of course, go to RCMP forensic labs and get them to approve our way of deactivation. And they pointed out certain things that we had to do. I think I'll just shut it off right now. No, please, no. Let me get my frontal <laughs> face. I want my frontal Kendall, as we're a... on the way to do the first stretch of deactivation. Yes, and there's an RCMP car behind us because I'm speeding, and now its lights are rolling. And we're I can see them flickering in your face. Yes. And we're going to be pulled over, and this will be the start of our deactivation day. And so, break up on the way to TPOF, right? Yes, on the way to TPOF. To deactivate. 3,500 firearms. We Maybe. don't know how many we're going to get done. But no, we don't know quite how many. A few done. I mean, this is the actual start of the project now, in the sense of the physical part of it. Just because now we get to use the plasma cutter and actually cut into the guns. This is the very first revolver handgun that Wallace is uh, deactivating right now. And now he's been instructed by an RCMP officer on exactly how he has to deactivate them. You become a gun smuggler, Bromley. Yeah, we're overweight, so we have to pack them wherever we can. So it's basically between the t-shirts and other bits in our bags. It's amazing to find somebody on the planet that actually maybe thinks like you, especially, you know, she's become mad, of course, now, because she's been infected by my madness. But at that time, it was quite neat. So she had the same basic vision, and we both basically understood what we were trying to do at a very early stage in this process. A lot of art comes through the subconscious, and that's how this came. Dream, the idea of the basic tomb or temple or prison shape, the room of mixed weapons came about. And then through successive dreams, the vision developed. And then Wallace and I started dreaming the same dream. And literally every night we would both start entering into this sculpture because it was a room. And uh, every night a new part of it developed. I mean, I remember one night when I walked inside of it. And, uh, you know, and then the shaft of light appeared. And it was an extraordinary, wonderful time that initial vision where it really did gel into what the final piece would, would look like. We needed a room because the room could imprison one. We were imprisoned by weapons and violence that surround us. And how do we find solutions? How do we get out of that room? There are a lot of peace initiatives in the world right now. There's a lot of energy heading towards trying to find solutions to conflict. As artists, the way that we try and fight this battle is through our art and our visions. Oh, what I is, think is really interesting this is, is that they're incredibly stock. worn. Yeah. Now what amazes me is, is, um, is that you can feel the hands on the gun yeah. where the where the wood's Look at this. worn. Boy. That's what amazes me yeah. about these. And an AK-47 is the most prolific gun in the world, uh, and the most successful gun in the world. So, yeah. They say that after a year in the water, 
they still fire. They still work. They still and that's why they make so many of them. Almost every country seems to, China, Russia, all over seems to produce these now. So these will end up on a panel. There we go. The firearms uh, I would pick up seem to have a transference to them. They seem to uh, hold with them the whole experience, the violent experience that they were used in. And it was, it was the oddest experience because you'd pick up one and it would be sort of quiet. And you pick another one up and it was just almost you couldn't touch it because it, it was just this aching of, of grief and pain and, and experience. It was almost like the victim was calling. And it was filled with, with weapons that were Weapons that were so, uh, oh, I don't know, just weapons that held, held the saddest energy I've ever. So to deal with that, um, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, I didn't want to work on that wall after a while, because it was so, uh, so exhaustingly sad. Each weapon has a history. Each weapon was used in crime or military action. And as soon as you know that, this Hollywood image of the weapon leaves and people actually start realizing, my God, you know, this is what robbed the bank, or this is what killed my friend's son, or this is what's used in war. Trying to come in and actually make artistic judgments uh, try and keep your emotion level very raw so that you can be truthful about what you're doing and make sure that the piece is speaking about the violence and the guns means that you have to open yourself up and become completely vulnerable to the, the elements, the characteristics of, of, of the material. And uh, so you're at your raw stage while you're making it. When you look around here and you look at all this stuff here, the gun is only the tip of the iceberg of what it represents as a violent thing. We've manufactured our own hate, we've manufactured our own anger, we've manufactured everything. And we became absorbed in that manufacturing process. And my job, or my intent I think is, and I think Sandra's too, is to uh, to somehow circumvent that and try to create a new awareness of how we can look at this and demanufacture ourselves from all of this crap that we're totally surrounded in. You can fill me up with math, you can fill me up with social, fill me up with science, but if I don't know how to be a human being, you filled me up with what? You know, where we have a school system that doesn't want to look at these issues because the parents might get upset. It's like teaching religion. Well, bullshit, you know, it's just absolute bullshit. We need to get off of our butts and teach the fact that we belong together and be human beings together. I mean, you cannot imagine how anyone could sit in this room here and think that any of this is correct. You couldn't possibly imagine that. It would be hard to believe there's a one human on the planet that would walk in the door and say, well, this all makes sense in this room. I should add, in the middle of all this, it became apparent that these weapons had such a strong impact that it would be very easy to mislead people on the purpose of our installation, and that we had to make sure that there was a human voice involved, because of course that's, that's what we're talking about here, is not just the material as such, but actually the effect on the human, human community. And that's where the images of the victims and the survivors came into our minds. And the idea that we had to have a presence outside of sculpture, a presence that would actually tell the real story. So the victims became the voice of now, the moment of now, the, the effect of all of this. So they became sort of the value or the cost.
So the victims became the voice of now, the moment of now, the, the effect of all of this. So they became sort of the value or the cost. It's beyond my comprehension that people have the lust or desire to own these things for what purpose? I mean, they're, they're killing objects. There's no reason why handguns or AK-47s or M-16s or any of this stuff should be on the street. Because of the touring aspect of this um, exhibition, we have to be very careful and keep it more almost like a relief to try and get the most effect with the thinnest layers. And what we also have to do at the end of this is uh, count exactly how many firearms and parts of firearms it's taken to make it and then weigh it to make sure we're within our weight restrictions. When the whole composition is up, we'll hang all the panels together and then we'll create one large design and then we'll solve the problems of how those sort of puzzle joints of the panels go together. Early on there was threats against us. If we do this, and this is what will happen with you. So that was a bit frightening because I've never been in a position where what I want to say could actually cause somebody to do myself or my family harm. It's been a revealing thing to be, you know, experienced to be um, targeted by them. The process of this sculpture was really a learning process for us. How to attach firearms to mesh, how to attach them to the frame, how to create a skin that was going to be flexible and yet intractable, how to create a balance so that the structure itself would actually hold itself together. We had no idea when we began in a sense of the total process of this because we've done work in metal in some ways. I've done some work in my past but we had never done anything of this scale. So we actually set up deliberate experiments. We set up deliberate experiments with the plasma cutter. We went to different places and tried out everything we could possibly try, even the different saws, so we knew what we could do to chop a gun up. The welding alone on this, there's silver welding using silver because we had to drop the silver in with the brass. Uh, there's the bullets that have a coating on that we had to take and have degreased and have that coating removed. There's a lot of guns that were totally uh, greased up that we had to take and have degreased. So that process was a search to find out how we could actually put this together. Holy. Ooh, wow. Uh, they just the slack came out of it. You know, you can imagine a civilization a thousand years from now, or even a million years from now, digging this thing out and saying, my God, what is this crude stuff here? You know, look what these people designed to actually torture themselves with. How uncivilized or how unintelligent this was. We believe very powerfully that change can happen in culture, that the actual culture mm -hmm. of violence can change. We believe that if we continue as, as a community, whether it's a local community or a global community, with the same attitude towards conflict, which is not, not solutions to conflict, but just actions of conflict, we believe it's a very negative future and that it cannot continue this way. Because arms have changed, mm. methods have changed, the ability to destroy each other has escalated to such a high amount that passionate decisions yeah. towards destruction can destroy us all. So we really believe that change has to be activated and we absolutely believe that it can happen. We had a lot of uh, angry suspicious, negative response from the gun lobby group. Uh, they assumed we were a government conspiracy, a liberal conspiracy to have another nail in the coffin for, for gun rights. Since it's been up, it's very hard for them to challenge that violence should be stopped. People can make a difference. They've got to be empowered towards a non-violent society. 
that's the whole point of this, is to inspire the whole feeling that uh, we can actually do something as a species. In my work, I listen to a lot of speeches about peace, and I even make a few myself. And I tell you, my friends, I have never seen a speech as eloquent about peace and the need to, to end the kind of violence that has made the 20th century the bloodiest century in humanity. I've never seen something as eloquent as that sculpture upstairs. I hope you will all have the opportunity that I had a few minutes ago of standing in the middle of that prison cell, surrounded by 7,000 guns from around the world, and remembering just for that moment what violence has done to us as a world. This is a wonderful moment for peace. I think that it is going to stimulate wonderful discussions and as we go forward in the culture for peace, developing it, the iHuman uh, 2000 gun sculpture will play a very important role. I think when you see the gun sculpture, you realize it is a very strong and unyielding depiction of the culture of violence. But it also is about a message of hope and the possibility of peace. It's important for me to be reachable or reached by the larger community. At the same time, it's very daunting to have the work go out, especially to Hanover, because it's, um, it's a world fair, and um, you lose a lot of control when it goes in an environment like a world fair, and artists like control. I think the Europeans understand the sculpture totally. One woman walked in and said, uh, she went around the sculpture and went inside, she said, you don't have to say anything. She says, I totally understand that it's about violence, it's about the waste of money on weapons. Uh, she totally grasped it by just seeing it. When the concept of the gun sculpture was initially introduced and we saw sketches, I must say I was very apprehensive. Conveying the message of peace through weapons to me in a country like Germany that's still highly marked by the war and war memories seemed to me a rather risky enterprise and I certainly voiced my apprehension. When I saw the reaction of the public, I was astounded and amazed how positively the sculpture was received. We live with such violent crime in our country where you don't just get robbed, you get raped and maimed when, when people want something simple out of your house. And something as basic as that sculpture just brought it back home. And what are we doing about this really basic thing that's affecting people's lives so much? I actually stood in a gas chamber in Dachau and I had the same chilling feeling when I walked into the sculpture that I had when I stood alone in a gas chamber in Dachau. And yet, I love the spotlight. In a sense, it's like the eyes of the world are on each individual that has a chance to interact with this piece. It adds to a sense of determination that we are obliged to come up with our own a way that we can make a difference. And because the death is so oppressive, that that ray of light to me was like a ray of hope. There's a mural that is supposed to be up, which talks about all the uh, victims of, uh, of violence. And it's incredible to see that they didn't need to, see, to have this. Just by seeing the, the sculpture, they already got the message. So that's pretty fantastic. We arrived in Korea two days ago, and within 24 hours we were standing uh, on uh, the border between South Korea and, and uh, North Korea. I didn't expect that. To be plunged into 
the absolute point of, of, of conflict and uh, uh, the concentrated statement in a way, visual statement or experiential statement of uh, the barrier because it is a barrier. It's not, it's not a border where you cross through one for the other. It's an actual stopped barrier like the Berlin Wall was or anything else, an enforced artificial barrier. Um, that brought it home to, to me again uh, uh, how they're still in this, this throes of, of, of conflict. They're working hard for reunification, but the history is so immense and the suspicion between the two sides is so immense. I think this is one of the critical parts in the world for the sculpture to come to because here you have a country uh, trying to unify itself and reconciliate with the North south to North Korea and even though the population here gives Santa and I the impression that they're not that interested in reconciliation because it might cause uh, money to flow from south to north and cause hardship in the south but I think there's a whole more likely a whole desire that once this land is reunified that it'll be a greater place than it was before so I think the message is very simple get over it. Just get along. This is ridiculous. These artificial borders that we keep creating are stupid. You know, dividing people up, it's stupid. Let's be honest. That's how I feel about it. Right, Bromley? <laughs> <laughs> I agree, but you've had quite a few conflicts in your life that you took a long time to get well, along. I, I know, but I'm trying. Now, I, that's what I'm saying. It takes a few years to do oh, this. Oh, you think so? Yes, mm. okay. Have some cake. <laughs> Welcome to the 100th exhibition of the Nobel Peace Prize. stiff, you know, that's the beauty of it all. Sandra's stiff, I know she is, but me? I like to build it, man. Wallace has a transference complex. <laughs>
have any dark washers, do you? Yes, I have one. Okay, I can I use it. To be associated or, or to be at an exhibition with the Nobel Peace Prize being the spark or the whole reason of the exhibition, I would have, not in my wildest dreams, no. would have gone there. So they pulled it off. Yeah, broke it. There you go. Yeah. Valuable, huh? What was yes. it? It's the handle to this. It's an old handle. It was an old carved so handle. That, yeah. But it's been taken since we came here. Shame. Yeah. So. That's incredible. Well, that's the problem, you know. Any of these handles that they can get off, you know. So that's, that's, that has been taken here. We simply now define the space it's in and we simply try to create that space and set it up and then the piece itself speaks. If there's not a weapon, there's no more war, maybe you can make a good country on the earth. I think so. Disarmament Affairs is conducting a conference on the control of civil arms across the world. They declare that there are 500 million civil arms around this globe, born in the hands of common men and women like us, people who desire to rule their own destiny. They claim that these arms are a threat to human progress. Well, more than half of those civil arms are here in America. They belong to you, and they belong to me. We own them as an inherent right of all men. To the United Nations, I said I will never register my arms. I will never ask your permission to own them. I will never permit you to confiscate them by force of law. I will die before I abandon my country of America and the rights of my beloved people to the authority of a committee of tyrants I will place your blue helmet upon my bayonet and I will carry it through the streets of this land.
exact figures, but at least two million people left their lives on the killing fields of Cambodia. They're mourned to this day, and the country shows great courage to heal its wounds by burning the tools of evil. Long ago, the Secretary General spoke of weapons of mass destruction, and as such, uh, some are immediately sent back uh, to the era of the nuclear arena, the biological arena, the terrible potential wars and threats that they presented to society. However, when you have seen 300,000 children killed in less than 100 days, the bulk of them killed by other children, I think that it's fair to say that small arms are weapons of mass destruction. That destruction was conducted by children upon children, children upon adults. It was not by sophisticated laser weapons. It was by basic instruments of war, no more in use by the developed nations and uh, distributed by whatever illicit needs that seems to exist. These weapons are permitting children to kill. These weapons are turning children, the potential of the future of many of those nations in conflict, into killers. They are guaranteeing that the cycle of one generation after another, continuing the devastation ad vitam aeternam. Children, mothers, are the instruments of reconciliation. They will permit those nations to build. Those who put weapons in the hands of children are conducting the most heinous crimes to humanity. Children as targets, children as, as shields, children as perpetrators of war. According to the Independent Small Arms Survey 2001, small arms are implicated in well over a thousand deaths every single day. As the weapon of choice in 46 out of 49 major conflicts since 1990, they contributed to roughly 4 million deaths, about 90% of them civilian and 80% women and children. In its action to date, the United Nations has made it clear that the uncontrolled spread and easy availability of small arms and light weapons currently kills more than 500,000 people each year in wars civil strife and crime.